Pray, Lord, we just uh, thank you for our time together tonight and just your blessing on us, Lord. You would move in our hearts, Lord, and really lead us in your grace, mercy, your peace, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your understanding and uh, for uh, the conference to come, Lord, for the Easter season, for this time together. We're thankful, Lord, that your mercy reigns, and we thank you in your name. Amen. All right, if we could, uh, now we can turn the lights up. And uh, if there's anyone here for the first time, if you're a guest with us tonight, would you raise your hand? We have a gift for you or a packet for you. Just raise your hand. We'll bring that to you. You hear? Uh, in that packet, there's a lot of great stuff about us. And then uh, if you have any questions, you could, um, you could do that at the, uh, ask those at the Welcome Center. Also, you're invited to a meeting Monday nights in the uh, cafe, uh, Seven Footsteps. And it'd be great if you want to be a part of that. All right. <clears throat> okay, now for a word of introduction, if you'll open your Bibles. Uh, had a <laughs> had a great class last night in a church history. <laughs> yeah, you know when I open my mouth about marriage, you're just really never sure what's going to come out. <laughs> you know, and I had to talk about you know Martin Luther really recognized something, and the Reformation changed things about sacraments. And there's three sacraments that the organizational, the imperial church, or however you want to call it, they had sort of like, you know, corrupted a little bit. The sacrament of baptism, sacrament of communion, and the sacrament of marriage. And, um, you know, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, it says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And, uh, you know, what had happened in history was that in order to try and help the, the priestly class become a little bit more spiritual, they decided to take something away from them, and that was women. And, uh, like, it was a weight that they could not bear. And uh, Martin Luther, as soon as he figured this out from reading the Bible, he went and stole himself a nun, and they got married and had six children. Um, <clears throat> It was, a, you know, it was a weight that they could not bear. Uh, there's a verse in the scriptures, uh, Hebrews 13, 4, it says, let marriage be held in honor by all. In the King James, it says marriage is honorable in all. But in other translations, the Amplify, the New American Standard, and others, it says, let marriage be held in honor by all, and don't let the bed be defiled, the marriage bed. It's like there's a subtle thing that can happen with that, like the weight that they put on these men trying to serve God in, an or, in a way to make them more holy, defiled their minds about something that God had made pure. And that's what happened. And when Martin Luther read the Bible, and I could see those guys reading the Bible, and then they get to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and then, ooh, Song of Solomon and you can just imagine reading the Bible in your own language, not being told what it said by a guy reading in Latin who had been told that he has to stay celibate for his life in order to get close to God. That was a weight that no one could carry. And the burden corrupted the whole thing. But God gives us an eternal weight of glory. And what is that weight? How is the weight that God puts upon us? I think it's like this. It's not something like that we carry like... Samson did this amazing thing. He lifted up the, you know, the tonnage of the gates of the city, put it on his shoulder, I think flexed his muscles, smiled, and then walked away from the Philistines to the top of a mountain with this thing on his shoulders. That's a weight. That's a kind of weight. But we know that Samson was not like really a uh, consistently spiritual person, was he, when we read that? But the eternal weight of glory that comes on, I think it's more like this. It's like it's like the Holy Spirit and God like just puts, the, puts his arm around you 
and the weight that you feel is not the weight of the strain. You got to exercise the pain in order to gain a closeness to God. The eternal weight of glory is the thing that Christ has rested upon us. That's what it is. He said, come unto me. Are you weak? Are you heavy laden? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and my burden is light. That's the weight of glory. That's the weight of glory. It's not for us to carry something and to create a way for us to get close to God. He already is here. And I think that's the great things about our fellowship. That's what we'll feel in Europe is like the weight of glory. And there'll be times like we felt it during the week of prayer. There were times in here when you didn't want to move. God was with us, sensing that we weren't really trying to carry something up to him. We were just letting him rest upon us and that the weight we felt was like very, very real, but also very, very gentle. It was like we knew that he was upon us. We know that he is upon us. We know that he is with us. And that's a much better feeling, isn't it? Than trying to carry something on our own. So I'm like really amazed and amazed by the finished work and the message again, the message of love and agape on Sunday that we heard and that our house is full of a weight, a weight that can be felt, but can be felt in a different way a weight that lets us know that he is here. That's it. Thank you. Pastor Love, I think. You... Hello. This is on and this is on because Pastor Love will take the offering. Uh, but I, I know that some of the varsity boys have gone to the airport to fly to Europe. Uh, but the girls and boys playing, in, they played in the States, is that right? Yeah. Okay, what, what the States is? State 50, United States. <laughs> Our state. States, yeah. possessive case, okay. Maryland's, you know, championship and Pat Lynch's, you know, compared to, you know, when he is on the, compared on the sideline of the court as a coach, if you compared him to Donald Trump, <laughs> Donald Trump would be like a kindergarten teacher compared to that guy right there. He's in charge. He's in charge. Uh, Coach, do you want to give out the cafe cards? Sure. Come on. <laughs> All right, so get off the bench. Yeah, get off the bench. All right, so I don't know. Who, who are, would you stand up? Your coach is going to give you a $5. Hey, this is not a. Hey. I want you to take it seriously. Okay, there it is. The, the names aren't there. I'm giving out. You're giving them out, yeah. All right, and those are congratulations from the church for you yeah, and yeah, your yeah. team. You play tomorrow. Right. And you Friday. play tomorrow and Friday. Yeah, tomorrow. Okay, girls play tomorrow at home. No, Check it out on the website, no details. <laughs> All right, forget it. Get moving. Okay, there you go. Thanks, Pastor. Okay. Amen. Wow, Coach Lynch. Look at him. Amazing. We'll get him a nice New York Knicks sweatshirt next time he comes up here. You can burn that Celtic uh, sweatshirt he has on. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so, uh, Grace Hour envelopes, if you have one and you can put something in there to help support the program, that would be great. Right after the program ended today, we got a wonderful text message from somebody in New England. They said, thank you. you. You hit the nail on the head today. It was perfect. It was just for me. Everything that was said just spoke to my heart. Can't thank you enough. That's amazing, isn't it? That something that comes here from Baltimore, right here in the studio in the church, reaches the country and reaches up to New England, reaches across the country, across the world, on the Internet. That's amazing. A lot of local churches don't have a radio program. Yours has one. 
and it touches the world, and that's amazing. So help support the Grace Hour. Amen? Okay. Coach Lynch, yeah, the other day in the championship game, they, they played in their league championship. They won their championship game on Saturday, last Saturday. They're the champions, okay? So, so I'm, I'm at the table, you know, because I helped him out. You know, we do the introducing the players' names. And I'm just sitting at the table, and he's a, he's a spiritual guy, Coach Lynch. He is. And he gets them all. Like, there's a timeout. We had a nice lead. The other team makes a run. They're closing in on us you know, cutting into the lead, and Coach Lynch gets them, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm pretty close, so I hear him. He goes, hey, hey, guys, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. He's not like X's and O's. He's Philippians 4, 6. <laughs> He's a, be anxious for nothing. Be ang-. And then his team, out of the huddle, they get out there. They make a, his, one of the guys on our team makes a bad pass right to the other team. And I heard him say, that's not being anxious for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Oh, we had so much fun. Too much fun. Um, listen, tonight in, in, in the offering, we have needs. And uh, just this past weekend, I was visiting another church on Sunday morning, and I was a guest there. And when they got up to take the offering, it, it was something because he, the, the man in that ministry who took the offering for that church, he got up and he just pleaded with the people. He says, you know that we have great needs. And I was so comforted because I thought, hmm, we're not the only church with great needs. And I mean, he, he made it sound like, you know, it's imperative that our giving, you know, come, we got to come through today because our, our offerings have been a little down. And, we, and I thought, wow, you know, that's probably like a lot of churches today, right? Um, there are great needs. And the best place, the best place, that we, and the best thing that we could do with our finances, with our money that God has entrusted to our care is when we give in the offering. That is the best time you know, that we have to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to our care. So tonight, yes, we need a great offering. And uh, we'll need great offerings as we move through the end of the winter and, you know, head into the spring months. So please, just take a moment quietly in your heart, pray, ask the Holy Spirit how and what you should give tonight. Join me. Father, bless this offering. Thank you for the privilege of giving, and we do so with grateful and joyful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
beautiful that's amazing we are God's anointed isn't that amazing uh, I have a uh, message tonight just to ha- uh, help us encourage us in our calling every one of us have a calling I, I want to jump around a little bit in the beginning Psalm 133 because of uh, that song and this beautiful principle of us being the anointed, the body of Christ is anointed. Uh, We are friends, we'll talk about that. Um, We, Sunday night, we said, out of thousands of marriages that were studied in this secular study, a psychological review of successful marriages. They also have what they call the disaster marriages. Uh, but they found that the, when there was no contempt, uh, when there was kindness, and they, they emphasized an extraordinary amount of kindness, and then number two, rejoicing together in common things. Like when a husband and wife rejoice together in common things, then the marriage is, uh, is successful or they stay together. And I just want you to remember that, those two things, being kind and then also like recognizing the, the good things that happen every day 
or, you know, generally the good things that happen and being thankful and sharing that together. And that's, um, that's what keeps. But we could say the same in the church, what keeps us together. But uh, the anointing of God, this is Psalm 133, uh, just a few words on this part. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, I am sure Pastor Chevelli could give story after story of seeing Africans who uh, have come to Christ in different countries, Uganda, Ghana, Zambia, um, Malawi, Zimbabwe, um, and, and then we are going this week to uh, uh, Europe, and um, it, it's uh, amazing, and we see it here in our church in Baltimore. Behold how good it is, how pleasant when we dwell in unity. One of the themes I want to speak about in Budapest is uh, loyalty, uh, friendship, um, because we have found that happen a lot in our hearts where we enjoy those qualities of commitment and faithfulness to each other. Mm. How good, how pleasant when we can really trust each other, kind of believe that your intentions are good, your life is honorable, that you have good desire, that the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you, though you are imperfect. And so the psalmist said, it is good and pleasant. We all need a home. We need a home. We need a place where we can relax. We can sit and receive. Uh, that's another little part of our message tonight, perhaps. Receiving. Um, and w what does the Bible say about receiving? Receiving one another. They received Paul when he was shipwrecked. Uh, when Peter took Jesus to rebuke him, it is really that word that Peter, it seems that Peter was kind of aggressively when Christ said that they were going to go to Jerusalem and he would be crucified. Peter, Peter took him and rebuked him. It is that word, uh, proslambanayo, some pronunciation, I don't know. But uh, regardless, the point is that receiving. And of course, God has received us when he sent Christ. We believed and God has received us. In Proverbs 18, 24, it says, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now, why my... my you know, brother, my brother would, well, I, you know, we, brother, what's wrong? He sticks closer than a brother. Like, what does that mean? Well, in a family, born in a family, brothers and sisters, it's kind of, you have to be, that's my brother, that's my sister. But there is somebody that sticks closer. They don't have to be. Remember Ronald Reagan adopted a son? He had the son by marriage, and then he had an adopted son, remember? And at the funeral service, he said, I am the son that was chosen. You know, the other son is there. <laughs> but I am the one that was adopted. I was the one uh, born into the family. That's those people, those are children that are your children, whether you like it or not. But when you are chosen, and when you have a friend who is a friend, not because he is your brother biologically, but he is your friend by choice, 
this is uh, how good and how pleasant when we find ourselves together. Uh, in 1989, we were at the Dunkin' Donuts over on Bel Air Road with Pastor Monty, and he said, let's go, let's go to the communist world. It is over. We, we, made a, we had napkins, you know, and we talked, and we put a team together, and we, where would we go? And he said, well, I'm going to fly back to Finland. I'll go through Budapest. I'll check it out. And back in those days, it was like crazy to think of living in that part of the world, but it was also our dream. By, and this is what I want to share tonight, the working of God. Now this word, working, I don't want to run past that word. There are three workings in our New Testament by three different agents. There, there is the working of the devil, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, 9, and 11, the Antichrist. There is the working of the devil, Ephesians 2, 2, and the children of disobedience. Then there is the working that is in my flesh, in my sin, the working of it. And then thirdly, there is the work, working of God. I have seen the work of God in Hungary, to my amazement. I have seen the work of God in Baltimore. I have seen the work of God in the body. We will we'll go through some of the verses in a few minutes. And one of the evidences of it is that we, it's like working, the word working in the classical Greek was used for a drug that works. The drug is working. We can say the devil is working in the United States. But we can also say God is working in the United States. God is working in us. Well, let's, let me see how, oh, okay. Back up a minute. I was amazed at what happened in Hungary years ago when we went there. We felt the working, the energian, the word there, the work of God. And then the work of God in us and the work of God with the Hungarians. Then we saw in years, as time passed, we saw in the Ukraine, we saw in Russia, we saw in Uzbekistan. In a 10-year period of time, we went to 24 former communist cities. In 10 years, and everywhere we saw the work of the working. But it's not like a world war or something. It's a, like a plant growing in a sidewalk or up on the rooftop of a building where you see in the gutter a tree growing. How could it grow out of the side of a building? But it does. You see the working of God in the backside. You see the working of God in, in a life in a school. You see a young person come and they start to read the Bible and understand it. And loyalty is part of that work. Loyalty. In a way that is so refreshing in a world where loyalties are broken very easily. They are broken commonly. Loyalty where you, that you would expect in the greatest institutions, family, marriage, government, institutions like schools, universities, businesses, contracts. You would expect loyalty and honesty and integrity. Well, we read in 2 Timothy 3 that in the end times, these loyalties would be broken. 
then people suffer. They suffer because there is now that working that is so destructive, the working of uh, Satan, the working of my sin nature that is at work. And then uh, this Psalm uh, 133, behold how, how hard it is and how disappointing it is when the brethren are all busted up. Psalm 2, cast their cords from us, break their bands asunder. Be critical, we have seen the attack on the church. And that's another theme for Eurocon. The attack of the wicked one, the evil one upon the church. And to break up relationships. To break up churches. Break, a, break down pastors and, and friendships that have been developed for decades and put in there the suspicion, the evil, the criticism, the negativity, the jaundiced eye, the feeling that you are betraying me, and I, I am so disappointed with you, the suspicion that comes from the human heart because there is not agape love. But here we have receive one another as Christ received you, John and Romans 15, verse 7. Receive one another, not to doubtful disputations, Romans 14, 1, but receive one another as we have been received. So we have an interesting, um, you know, time in Europe with all these amazing friends that have been born from God and have decided to travel far and be together. And uh, Wednesday night, next Wednesday, we'll maybe in Budapest, you'll see it on the internet, we'll have the high schoolers come up on the stage and wave to mom and dad that are here in Baltimore. Uh, I don't know how the service will go, but we will be doing the service there in Budapest uh, for the conference and also for you here in Baltimore. And we are touched by it. We would like to speak a few things about it. Okay, look at chapter 133 again. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Why ointment? Well, there's a, when the priests made a batch of anointing oil, according to my rough calculations, when I looked at the recipe in Exodus 30, made a general calculation of 35 pounds of oil in one batch. We don't know how much was poured on this priest but it, it, because so much oil came upon him, he was just saturated with the oil. It ran down his beard, all the way down his garments. He was completely covered with oil. Well, Christ is the priest. He is the anointed one, totally and completely. And we are his garments, that it comes down on the, from the head, down all the way, and we are drinking of the same spirit. That is a spirit of loyalty, trust. That is a spirit of receiving one another. That is a spirit of welcoming one another in our space. That is a spirit of putting trust upon each other and saying, this is what I believe about you. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Many people in our torn up world are very hurt and looking for this kind of love. And it's only from, not from our 
goodwill or our efforts or noble abilities. No. We are unable completely. But if you trust God in every area, you trust God in challenging areas of your life, you'll find that God will anoint you with fresh oil. Psalm 92.10. I was in the Bible college tonight listening to Dr. Stevens. It warms my heart when I listen to him. It warms my heart. I have all my life been doing this, all my life, and been in Bible college in the beginning. And Every year of my life since 1972, I have been either a student or a teacher except for one year. How privileged I have been. And when I listen to him and I look at these students there listening respectfully, waiting upon God, anticipating words from God, maybe not understanding everything, but I say, this is God. God is working. As in another classical illustration was the, uh, uh, in a battle, when they were able to uh, bridge the wall, when they were able to go up the wall of a castle or a fortress, and they were able to do it, it, they, it, the word was that it was working, or it works. The, the battle and the fighting and their attempt was working. It is not potential working. It is kinetic. It is active working. It's not theoretical working. It is actually in practice. It is working. That's the key to your life. It works. That's the thing that we can say. I don't know how we can say, I'm not sure how I got here, but I can say that something's going on. God is working. And it's not like, like something I, I am theoretically embracing, but it is something we are practically experiencing. And when we come to Uricon or in Baltimore at the June Convention, and we kind of look at each other, we kind of are like bearing witness and saying, God is working. God is at work. And it says here, in the last verse, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. <clears throat> Here it is, the doctrine of it, the working. As I said, the devil is working, and many times as believers we emphasize that point. The devil is working. I can't believe the days we are living in. I, I, I look at our country, I see the politics, the ideology, the absence of the Bible, the, uh, the way decisions are made, the kind of leaders, and so on and so forth. We say, maybe we could say the devil is working, but yes. But there is something great that is working that we can see. And it is God is working. God is working. He is. Jesus had 12 disciples. And there they go. There's 11 of them you could uh, see. They, they have a calling. God is effective in his calling. Number one. The power of God is effective in the resurrection. Nothing can overcome that reality. The resurrection. Christ was resurrected. The work of resurrection. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead also quickens our own body. Romans 8, 11. Don't underestimate the value of sitting in a class and listening in a spirit of worship and trust, where you're saying, I, uh, I have nothing. I am trusting God. I have no plan B, only a plan A, trusting God. 
And if I, I sink, I sink. But I will trust God as I sink. I, I have found that, that God, God is my alpha and my omega. I have no other plan. Number two, God is effective or working in ministry. God speaks through those who speak for him. We have heard young men up here on the pulpit preaching, and we say God is working through them. We have heard of the young ladies that are doing Bible studies and loving each other and encouraging each other. We say God is working through them. We hear about the little ones in the GGLC and uh, the staff with Kim and how amazing that group of ladies are. We say God is working there. In the dorms across the street, we say God is working. And in a prayer meeting or in a kitchen across the street or wherever your dorm is, we say God is working in the ministry. We are listening to the voice of God. When Job, and this is the message for later, when Job was tested, it was a test of loyalty. Ha, 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 Satan said. You touch him, he will curse you. God said, he's yours. Don't kill him. Remember? Satan went to work. That's a great study. Satan worked. Wow. The storm, the w wicked armies, the bandits, uh, the murderers, the killers, the climate, the clouds, the air. He's the power of the air. And Satan went to work, and he can do it to you and me also. God has put a hedge around some of us for some time. But in that dark hour, in that moment of trial, in the time of difficulty, he will find that though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Because we have found that loyalty, trust, truth on the inner part, love. My father loves me. Yes, it's hard. But he sets the solitary in families. Psalm 27.10 He will not leave us or forsake us. No, never. Well, that's a work of God. When in the heart of Job, he is saying he's struggling and wrestling, and we know something about it. But we can say God is testing every one of his moral creatures, whether they are angels or men. They have been tested, the angels, and now men and Abraham, his servant, and, and Christ, his son, all of them tested, and you and I. But don't fear, because he works. Like the drug is working. God is working in us. And his work is in the ministry. The next one, the power of God is effective within the church. The church is built up with, by the power of God, Ephesians 4.16. Special gifts are given in the ministry. There is the gifts of leadership and teaching and preaching and healing. I want to emphasize the word healing. Healing is a work of God. God is healing. He has not stopped healing. He is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. Healing is his Compassion. He does it because of compassion. He cares. And we've heard some fresh testimonies about that recently. One, Ua is talking about her dad in the nursing home in Sweden. Oh, the, the bottom of the leg, uh, just no circulation, cold, blue. In the nursing home, the doctors say just, it's just a big problem to bring blood into that 
part of his body and they prayed and then they, the next day they looked and it was like pink flesh, like a baby. And the doctor said, how did this happen? How did this happen? From like borderline, you know, whatever the word would be, not gangrene, but there's death to the body, but the two, a miracle. God is working. God is working with a little Ruth in the backside in Moab. God is working with a little guy who's got, says to Samson, Samson said, put my hands on the pillars, and the little boy did it. God is working with a little lady that told Naaman that there's a prophet in Israel. God is working in the church. God has got gifts and works that are happening every day. By God's work in our country, God needs people like you and I in the United States caring about our neighbors and our people. You know, I, I think I was thinking recently, what if I had a friend for 30 years and I never cared about bringing them to Christ? Think about it. I work with somebody I know them for 30 years. Change the number. 10 years. I know them for 10 years at work. We play around. We go to the bar. We know each other. We meet each other every day. And I have never, for 10 years, I have never, never cared about sharing with him this most important question. Ed, where do you go when you die? Debbie, what about your future? And then, you know, all the kind of talk that goes, you know, the common talk. Well, you know, and then you are there and you've got a very biblical, sharp, loving, compassionate message for them. Dad, I cannot imagine going to heaven and not seeing you there. I cannot imagine me being with you as a friend and not telling you the most important thing you could ever hear. Debbie, I could not imagine that I, I'm working with you day after day, week after month after month, and I've never talked to you about this most important subject. But listen, the United States is filled with those kind of people. I, I am convinced of it. I am not condemning them, but I am just saying, come on. There is a power of God that is working in you and me. There is a work of God that is happening at our workplace. There is a purpose of God in our driving to work every day and driving back home. There is a message there that comes from God's heart that goes to us because the oil comes down upon us. And it's here in our conference or in our church service where we sense the oil that comes and kind of stirs us and says, yeah, I know the devil is working in the end days, but I know that God has a great plan and he's gathering together and receiving people to himself. Okay. Then a couple more. God's power is seen this way overcoming sin through Christ and in Christ there comes that power by which man's being of humiliation can be changed into Christ's being of glory the humiliations and frustrations and the defeats of sin are swallowed up in the power of God I have sinned I can say I have sinned and then in a moment thank you God I can see, I, I realize you did not make me to bury me, to bring me down and defeated and hurt and low and poor and defeated and I can't do anything. Oh no, he is our glory and the lifter of our head. Let my sentence come from your presence, Psalm 17, 2. Oh no, he has filled us and shown us that we have power over our sin. We know it. And then another one, God's power is effective in the world. 
This is not a world which is out of control. I like that statement. I see it in the world. No, this is not a world out of control. No, God is working in this world. And I always thought somebody had said it or I heard about it. I thought about it in regards to the Soviet Union, which was strictly communist. And then Gorbachev comes. Gorbachev comes out of nowhere. Where is Gor? How did he do that? How did he have the power? How did he change it? How did he liberate? How did they get out of communism without a civil war? How did they do that without, without a gunshot? How did he change that whole system? How did he do it? Gorbachev did it. Ronald Reagan was part of it and so on. But I'm trying to say something that we are in a world that is not out of control. God is working in the world. God has leaders that are in the world. The heart of the king is in the hand of God. And Haman wants to murder uh, Mordecai, but there's something deeper going on. Haman has power, but God has greater power. God is working. We are in exciting days. Come on, bring it on. The election is coming. Come on, have the Christians woken up yet? Have we realized? Have we seen the enemy? Have we seen the whites of his eyes? Have we realized the work of evil that is in our world to destroy the souls of men? And they mock and ridicule who we are, but our loyalties are sure. Come at us full force. You'll find that we have teeth. Come at us with all your power, and you'll find there is another power. There is a living God who is with da the God of Daniel and David and the three Hebrew boys, the God of Paul and Barnabas and Timothy, the God that said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I will be working with you while the devil is working with his people. I will be working with you, and I will, yeah, I will use you to have a great influence in this dark world. God's power is effective inside you, Ephesians 3.20. Then there are certain ways which God's power becomes effective. Here's a short list. By his word, his power is effective. Hebrews 4.12. I want to finish up because it's late, but listen. Oh. By sitting in the church and getting my ears and my heart listening in quietness, studying to be quiet, studying to listen to what is said, what is not said, what is meant to be said, wanting to hear what the Spirit is saying. By listening the word, there, there is power in those words, life-changing power in the words. Number two, God's work is effective through love. Love is the energizing power which turns knowledge into devotion, faith into sacrificial service. When you are sacrificially showing up to the house of God, when you sacrificially get on your knees and you lift your heart, your heart and your hands to the Lord in faith and you say, God is love, and God is there saying, I am working in you, I am working with you, I am present with you, I am behind you in your faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, so enjoy your faith, make decisions by faith, pray by faith, give by faith, live by faith, and share your message by faith. Then another one. God's power is effective through prayer. Prayer is empowering contact with God. Prayer is not only a gateway to God for us, it's a channel for God to us. Answers to prayer. Prayer, wow, valuable. Much happens through prayer. Answers, impossible things. God answers prayer. God works through prayer. Then he works through evangelism. 
Learn to evangelize. Let me finish up. This is a good time. I don't know if it's still raining out there. We don't have umbrellas, so we'll stay inside for a while. Listen, God's power is effective through evangel. Thanks for the community groups. Thanks for the groups that gather in Dunkin' Donuts, and they, they have a little strategy. They pray, and they go out and meet their neighbors and knock on doors. Thanks, Pastor Coop, for the outreach in the city. Uh, thanks to all those that do visitations and counsel in people's homes and go door to door in the neighborhood. It is a joy. God's power is in it. Somebody will say, they, they, they will be, you will find some people, it'll happen. They will be deeply affected. They will be affected by God, God's work through evangelism. So that's it. We're going to, some of us will be over there, you'll be over, we, you're here, and we're rejoicing. There'll be trials in our lives and in the future, in the ministry, but we have found ourselves enjoying our, you know, when the, when the, when the, the work of evil happens anywhere, when that work of evil happens, it's very real, it's also very powerful. But it can, it's no match for this power that we fellowship with, with the oil that comes from above, the mind of Christ, the words of love. And there is a friend, not because he's a brother and he has to be there because he's your brother and he's born in the same family with the same mother and father. No, he's not there because of that. He's there because he's a friend, born from God, wants to be with you receives you, believes, like has a way of thinking, as we do as a great team. And the team is not only here be in these walls, but our team is, is God's team. And we, who knows how uh, the extent of it, but we know that we are part of something extraordinarily incredible, amazingly wonderful, the breadths and heights and depths and lengths, we cannot comprehend it. We have not yet seen what it is. We see through a glass darkly, but by your imagination you can imagine God has made something wonderful here. God is working here wonderfully in your heart, in your life. Don't underestimate it. It's not for sale. I have purposed in my heart to walk faithfully before our faithful and loyal God. Okay? Amen. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Father, I just thank you for all these amazing brothers and sisters who have learned and walked. Bless our times these months. We pray tonight, anyone who does not have Christ, please take him tonight, receive him by faith. Say to him, I need you, Lord, trust him. He'll save you, wash your sin away. Anyone at all saying that prayer, put in your faith in Christ, would you raise your hand? The ushers will give you a booklet. And thank you to the church for the prayers. All of us are praying that God will add to the church daily such as should be saved. God will do this work amongst us and in us, and we'll get outside our comfort zone. We will live in faith and see the power, the working of God in 